Welcome to the Business Performance Podcast, where we feature expert thought leaders and cover their best strategies, stories, and advice that you can use to successfully mature your own business performance. Because as you know, if you don't know where you're going, any road will do. Now, here is your host, Henry Schneider. Hello, everyone. This is Henry Schneider with the Business Performance Podcast. And today, it's my pleasure to talk with Roland Siebelink, who has been involved in the tech industry for many, many years. He's now heading up his own company, advising and coaching founders of tech startups and scale-up companies around the world. So, Roland, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you, Henry. Appreciate to being here. Thank you for the invitation. So, to begin with, would you please briefly describe your company, the types of customers you work with, and the types of services you provide? Yes, absolutely. So um, I run a company of facilitators and coaches that help uh, technological startups move all the way from their seed financing stage to their um, later on stability or exit, if you will. So it's really the guidance through this whole scale up journey that we help them with. And um, our mission there is to uh, help the founders stay in charge of their startup for as long as they want to. Okay. And as you work with these founders on the startups, what's the importance of quality to your clients? Quality? Mm-hmm. Um, well, I would say that um, uh, many people have a very um, 100% view of quality. So, you know, it is important, of course, to reach the quality that the customer requires. And on those points where you want to differentiate, you want to be very much better than what uh, the market typically offers. But I would also say that um, people assume that the best to strive for is perfection. And I would also say that most businesses do not run on perfection. If you wait until things are perfect, you are going to uh, launch very little and you're gonna be behind the market in many ways. And so I really live by the uh, motto that I learned from Alan Wise, uh, who says life is about success. It's not about perfection. I don't think he invented it, but it was his big eye-opening moment as well. And uh, that's something that I teach uh, more and more to the people I work with, especially when they have maybe like an engineering background or a science background, where of course you've been trained to strive for perfection uh, Mm -hmm. more than anything else. And that's something that in business does not always apply. Yeah, and the, the, the interesting thing is the customers don't care about perfection. They want something right away. Otherwise, you become prisoners of inertia. You keep working and working and working, polishing that rock until it shines, but then you, you've lost ground. Uh, very wise words, Henry. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the big number one biggest challenge you face when you work with these startups? Um, I'd say the biggest challenge is that um, a typical founder is really at heart an inventor of a great product. They came to market with a certain idea and they had some certain technological background that enabled them to realize the idea. Um, And now, rather than keeping to polish the products and adding new features, the real challenge is not so much that, but it's to turn it into a proper business. First, to learn about how to sell and how to satisfy customers, but over time, also how to do all of that, not yourself, but through more and more layers of people below you that uh, are helping you to do the work. And so um, it is important for these founders to learn to move from an inventor of a great product to a leader of a great company. That requires phases and phases of constantly reinventing yourself learning new things, letting go of things you used to be great at, because now, guess what, you're delegating them to people. And that, I say, is the biggest challenge, which is why most of the trajectories I do with uh, companies are typically around three-year time frame, because it's not a one-day thing that you can learn and then, then you're good to go. So how, how are you able to get these companies over the hump with these challenges? I mean, what specifically do you do to help them out? Um, Yeah, usually the the man starts from uh, a realization that the company is basically feeling like a house of cards. They've experienced rapid growth. They've got a lot of people that have joined the payroll. And now it's unclear what everyone does. It's unclear what the overall goals are. They're having trouble with alignment. And that's usually when I come in with the first workshop to 
help align the top team, uh, make things discussable that were not um, really debatable before, like the elephants in the room, mm -hmm. and have them come out with a fresh insight and energy around okay, these are really the top five priorities that we should all focus on the next quarter so that they can start instructing their teams that way. And then essentially, we keep doing that on a quarterly basis because there's this natural rhythm in people's spirits where after 80, 90 days, it all fizzles out, I would guess, right? So that's when you need some renewal. And over time, we start adding more and more proper strategic elements in that mix as well. So whereas in the beginning, it's really more about you know, can we actually set a goal and keep focusing on it? That's already hard enough. Over time, it becomes more important to also say, have we set the right goals and are we using our resources in the best possible way with the biggest bang for the buck, with the biggest chance of winning over a certain niche in the marketplace? Okay, so as you mentioned, you work a lot with um, engineers and scientists who are <laughs> focused on a, um, perfection and not necessarily business. So how do you, are they coachable and trainable so you can get them focused on doing business better? Or are they kind of, or is it another group where they just can't make that leap and you're gonna bring somebody else in? Well, I would say um, whether people are coachable or not, of course, is not a black and white uh, question, but certainly certain people are more uh, open to it than others. And I would generally say, that's why I do a lot of due diligence before I start working with the company. Uh, because if I find that somebody really feels um, that they know everything already and they're not very coachable, um, then it's hard for me to help them. Um, sometimes the demand is then even stronger from the people around them. <laughs> a situation like, please God help us with this person, you know. Yeah. But still, I truly believe people do not change by themselves or by circumstance. They only tr change when they truly run into their own walls. And Right. Sometimes that's just not there yet and people are not ready there. Um, and then maybe it's better to wait a little bit until people are ready. The, the emotional driver, I would say, that makes people um, ask for my services is also that when they attract venture capital, um, they realize it's almost a pact with the devil in a way. <laughs> not to talk badly about venture capital, but you do give up some control of your company and, and subsequently more, of course, so that... Uh, there is always a risk that at some point in time you do not perform well anymore as a CEO and they could ask you to step aside. It mm -hmm. used to be very common that by the time you raise a Series B, uh, that would be par for the course. It would be part of the deal that the original founding CEO would step aside. Unfortunately, these days, most VCs are smarter than that and they realize the value of having a founder in charge. But I would also say that is on the condition that the founder keeps learning. And mm -hmm. that's where I come in. I help them stay in that learning mindset, uh, staying open to new competences, new forms of mastery they can learn. Whereas, um, you know, somebody that's doing it all by themselves and only has maybe uh, the yes men and yes women around them but may find that. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. Um, like what I read um, the lean startup here over the summer. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of scales down what I've been doing for many, many years, but it's the same thing. I mean, Eric Reese talks about having pride in the initial product and being so proud that he couldn't see this forest with the trees. He had a humbling exercise to be able to scale it down. Absolutely. Reed Hoffman says that if you're not completely embarrassed about your first product, you're not launching it fast enough. <laughs> okay. All right. So what are the top three things that excite you about working with tech startups scale-ups? Uh, I'd say first is really the mission and the, the purpose that people see behind it, the full passion about uh, wanting to make the world a better place. And I know this is a cliche and we laugh about it a lot here in Silicon Valley, but I do believe that all successful startups really do have that mission at heart. It's not just about trying to make a quick buck or to, to strike it rich. It really is about uh, seeing a problem and wanting to help people solve that problem. And uh, even if that's just how to get a more efficient taxi ride or how to get uh, a, a more amazing place for your next holiday, those are still problems that we can do better at and where, where people have built gigantic businesses, right? Yeah. Um, 
I'd say the second is um, I like working with tech scale-ups much more than corporates just because of the quality of the people. Um, they are very good at selecting highly driven, very clever, smart individuals uh, that are typically very open to learning. And so it's an extremely rewarding environment if you're trying to uh, teach people some principles of management, of leadership, and uh, just new ways of making the company run better. Whereas in, in my corporate uh, environments that I've had experience with in the past, sometimes you get into such a situation where everyone's just hunkered down and doesn't want, to, doesn't want anything to change around them. Um, and that can be really, really uh, da damaging, I would say, uh, for the company and, and for those people themselves. Sure. So after you spend the three years with a company and you've expanded and scaled them up and things to hit now where they're, they're settled down, what is your advice to help, help them remain healthy and growing and become and continue to be successful? Yeah, and a very good point. Actually, by the time I typically... Um, you know, graduate them from my program, I would call it in three or four years, it doesn't mean they're done growing. It means just that they are much more confident in how to manage that growth and how to deal with it properly. And I would say part of that is to be very aware of your core and your core identity strengths and to keep coming back to those when things go awry. Um, so many people especially in the beginning feel like they should expand into new fields they should try new competences they get a little bit bored with what they've already built and i'd say that's in most cases a recipe for um, a lack of success if you keep trying new things and you don't fully commit to anything uh, that's going to make it very hard to make a sustainable long-term growth business the ones that have been very successful have been the ones that either always stuck Thing, or more likely where they did a few experiments then realized this is really not us okay we divert those again and we focus on our very core and i would say dropbox is a great example of that where you know they knew that they're great at syncing uh, files across different devices and then they understood their revenue driver is storage uh, the more people store the more they will sign up for a premium package and that then led them to start acquiring all kinds of companies that would increase storage, such as a photo uh, organizing library or a mail uh, email box, all these things. And uh, it quickly led to a completely chaotic situation where none of these companies were adding true value. Uh, gigantic distractions for management, not even knowing how to organize everything. And so to their credit, after about a year, one and a half years, they decided, look, all these activities are not core for us. You have to focus on the core use case of synchronizing files across all these different platforms. And I'd say I've been very impressed with their new product, um, Dropbox, that is uh, helping you now to even um, sync across other kinds of cloud drives and have everything in one place. It's very impressive. Yes. So that, that brings to mind, you know, one of the things where you got to keep your eye on the end goal. Don't always stay there, but... Keep experimenting, trying this, trying that, but don't lose sight of your vision of where you want to be. Absolutely. Jim Collins calls this the hedgehog concept, and I'm a true believer in that. It's like these three elements, focus on what you're passionate about, what you can make money with, and where you have a unique competence to offer. And it's very close to a Japanese concept called Ikigai, which has uh, those uh, three dimensions plus one fourth, which is... Which is where can you offer the world most of what you have to offer? And I think that's good advice for a company. It's also good advice for people searching what job to strive for in their careers or how to be happy in their lives in general. So the, 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 I guess the hottest topic these days is you've got cybersecurity, and then you've got AI, machine learning, mm -hmm. RPS, et cetera. So, uh, you know, for the clients that you're working with, is that kind of, what's the distribution on, you know, are they kind of evenly spread around or more focused on one thing? Everyone has a dimension that is focused on artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, in some, it is more core to the entire experience. Um, for example, I work with a company out of Switzerland and Boston uh, called Scandit, and they are replacing these old handheld barcode scanners with just Ooh. smartphone apps. Um, yeah. That may not sound revolutionary, but the fact how they apply artificial intelligence and machine learning 
now makes it possible for a logis logistics agent to scan an entire pallet of boxes with just one picture. And that, uh, you know, creates gigantic productivity improvements uh, all out of it's moving it from hardware to software, right? So for them, it's very core. Um, I have other clients such as a chat application and a, uh, a math tech platform where artificial intelligence machine learning is more used in the analytics side, uh, sometimes a little bit of predictive chat. Um, everyone has, has some degree of focus on it also because it's very hot with investors. I think ultimately we'll have to look at what are the areas where it truly makes a difference versus where is it just a fashionable topic to add to your product roadmap. Sure. So the other, the other thing too that kind of goes along with this is a lot, lot, of, lot of these startups have a consulting piece and then a product development piece. So what's your thoughts about having consulting and then having like a development? Yeah, um, very good question. So in uh, tech scale-ups, um, people are very focused on scalability. So I would say in most cases, the initial um, mission is really much more to build a product and um, even to be reluctant to be too close to customers, uh, let alone do consulting for them. But if you dig deeper, you find that some of the most successful uh, startups of the last five to ten years actually did almost do consulting. Mm -hmm. uh, I would recall Stripe, the payments platform that famously uh, made it very easy for developers to integrate into their platform. And yet, the two founders, the Collison brothers, would actually go and visit early stage companies that were interested and integrate it for them right there on the site. So you could call that a form of consulting, but what it really was, was a form of market intelligence. Like how do I get to talk to these people and get to know our clients and their daily problems? So as Steve Blank would say, get out of the building, get off of your effing, excuse me, uh, be, uh, excuse me once again, and go talk to the customer, right? Yeah. Um, and, and another uh, take would be that, um, especially in more complex enterprise software, um, founders often underestimate the value of consulting or what we would call professional services mm -hmm. um, as a great revenue driver and especially as a way to uh, get companies to keep paying the yearly licenses. So I worked with a company in Chicago, InRule, and they recently had a very successful acquisition. They were acquired by a private equity fund to keep them growing even faster. Um, and there, uh, they found that um, increasing professional services led to an, an, an explosion of the renewal rate and of the, uh, the satisfaction of customers with the product because, in a way, just handing them the license and say, here you go, was not enough for the full customer experience to come about. Yeah, you know, that's interesting because you know, that, kind of, that's kind of my philosophy too is that you need to be in there having a FaceTime and actually talking to the customers and it goes back to this old concept of solution selling for many, many mm -hmm. The same thing. You talk to the clients, talk to the customers, find out what their pain points are. Then you bring that back inside and you can actually build something that they will want and use, not something that's academic and may not go anywhere. Absolutely. Um, it's why uh, the, the people at Y Combinator, the most famous startup incubator in Silicon Valley, will always tell people in the beginning, do things that don't scale. Do not optimize for scale prematurely. Optimize first for the best customer experience. It's better to have 100 people that love you than 10,000 people that like you. And so optimize for that and then the scale will come later. Yeah. Well, the other thing too is bad news travels fast. If you make a mistake, <laughs> it doesn't it, right? <laughs> but good, when it's, when it's good, Nobody ever talks about it. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, unless it's 10 times better than the market, then you get people talking. And that's what we usually have to strive for with a startup because people underestimate the degree of inertia that there is otherwise. Like, why would I move away from a product that's serving my needs just fine? Uh, if all you can do is make it 2% better, better, I'm not going to go through the trouble. You know what I mean? Right. It has to be 10 times better and then I'll be happy to try it. And I've already heard this statement too, is that if you're going up against an existing product, the incumbent always wins. You've got to have something that really distinguishes you from the competition. Otherwise, you're not going to go anywhere. Yeah, it has to be a factors better, absolutely. And then, of course, we can 
look at, well, where does this particular customer find themselves in the customer adoption life cycle? That, that's a big theme with startups uh, ever since uh, Jeffrey Moore published the famous book, Crossing the Chasm. And mm -hmm. it's important for them to realize that not every customer is the same. You know, a typical startup founder is a bit of a hacker or a visionary or a bit of both. And they like selling to customers that have that same mindset, but they don't readily realize that only about 15% of the market in any given market consists of hackers and uh, visionaries. Right. The other 85% is where you really make a killing, and those are the conservatives, the pragmatists, the people that don't, don't want to spend too much, the people that are afraid of change. Right. And so finding a product and building it in a way that appeals to those people is the real bigger challenge. Often it requires almost a complete reinvention of your initial product mm -hmm. to get to that 100% product package. Sure, okay, so before we began, we were talking about a recent success you've experienced. So could you please relate the story mm -hmm. of how you helped this client? Yeah, so this was uh, Inroll. Uh, I already mentioned them briefly. Uh, so Inroll is a company based out of Chicago that has been offering a decision management uh, solution for about 15 years now. So um, it's essentially a software that is used in big banks, insurance companies, uh, government institutions to apply algorithms to approvals. For example, when people are approved for a loan or denied for a loan, um, when they, there's a decision about whether they um, are eligible for benefits, these things are based on a number of rules, usually a quite complicated set of rules, right? And the problem was that these rules keep changing because right. legislation changes, the environment changes, the policy of the company may, may change. So what that means in terms of automated systems is that every time again, that change of policy, that change of legislation would then lead to a change request for the IT department. Can you please make this change and change that percentage from 50% to 48.5? And we all know how great IT departments are at implementing change requests quickly. So, you know, typical two to three months, I would say, in most corporations, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so you got to a point where nobody was really in charge anymore of what are the current rules that we actually apply, are we compliant, uh, do we even have control over these rules. So what in rule builds was essentially a black box where business users can set these rules and change them and even simulate different rules. Mm -hmm. And that then ties into the architecture of the overall backend system so that the engineers don't have to bother with all these tiny change requests anymore. And at the same time, the black box guarantees that it's wasteable and robust so that the engineers know that this will not break their system. And that's really been a revolutionary change in the world of um, highly regulated systems, uh, as I mentioned, financial services, uh, medical, uh, government-related institutions. Okay. So reflecting upon that, what would you say was the moral of the story? The moral of the story or the big theme, I, th I think, was that sometimes it's better to focus on those segments of the market where you have a true success rather than to try and cover very many and keep trying. Um, so um, without revealing too much of our internal discussions, of course, I would say that when we came in and we started discussing the strategy, the company was quite thinly stretched across maybe 60 or 70 different potential market segment combinations. And many of them, they were not particularly successful in. So you would see them expanding a lot of effort and energy of segments where they had no real chance of winning. So part of what we did was to analyze um, industry-wise, but also in terms of use cases, in terms of the, uh, the ideal buyer, and even in terms of geography, where are the combinations where you have the most realistic chance of adding true value, really winning? And that, I think, was the key. And then finally reducing that number of combinations, maybe back down to just 10, 15, depending on the latest uh, status, uh, where they had far more competitive firepower at hand uh, to really conquer those fields. Okay. And that, I think, was absolutely crucial in leading them to uh, uh, get this, uh, this acquirer interested in investing so much money and bringing them to the next level. Okay, great. So kind of shifting gears a little bit, after working with a bunch of different companies over the years, 
what are some of the common pitfalls or mistakes that you see them making that you need to keep in mind as you work with them? Mm -hmm. um, I'd say um, I already mentioned that uh, one particular caveat is to um, take off the inventor's hat and put on the leader's hat, right? So uh, that has to be a very conscious process. And that means uh, delegating some of the day-to-day -day work uh, to um, other product people, other engineers, and uh, stopping coding, for example, is already a big uh, challenge for many founders even early on. Let's say the team of delegation in general, it, um, closely tied with accountability, is another pitfall. Uh, you would be amazed to see how many of these companies, even if they have over 100 employees, sometimes even over 500 or 1,000, are still run like a big spider web where every single decision still has to pass the CEO founder. And so uh, obviously that makes them a gigantic bottleneck, uh, the kind of company where nothing moves without the CEO having one minute to discuss every single proposal on the table. Mm -hmm. I often mention to these companies, look, it's, it's ultimately not about scaling um, you know, sales or scaling the number of people or scaling the number of clients. What I really think you're scaling is the number of decisions you can make in parallel. And that requires delegating a lot of these more technical decisions like, can I give this customer a discount, yes or no? Mm -hmm. Should we work with this business development partner, yes or no? Uh, should I go for this, uh, this newspaper article? All these things, if there's no rules for it, no process, guess where they all end up? Mm -hmm. on the desk of the CEO, right? Mm -hmm. I often joke with my clients, you're the chief exceptions officer, aren't you? <laughs> you <know>? uh, <laughs> so that is the kind of stuff where really nobody wants to be spending their time on those kinds of decisions when they're in the executive chair. And therefore, if we can set just a few ground rules and a few basic what I call leverage decisions in terms of here are our priorities, here are the markets we compete in, here are our pricing standards, then with just a few of these decisions in place, you can now let everyone do their job and get on on a daily basis. And that I think is probably the biggest theme uh, I see. And I'd say the third is uh, probably more specific for tech companies where uh, they are so excited about the inner workings of the product that they become almost myopic in uh, explaining the features to people rather than getting close enough to customers to understand what are the true benefits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, what you're saying reminds me of my experience many years ago working with a company that had graduated from being a startup, but the, the CEO was, was still the founder who had came out of his garage. He had a president, and the president had a sign off on all purchases. And I eventually got them to say, mm -hmm. let, let the accounting manager have authority up to a thousand bucks. And so then, right. he could, then he could kind of streamline the things, make things move a lot faster. Absolutely. And, um, you know, it's, um, I often say like when there is bureaucracy, it usually signals a fundamental lack of trust. I think nobody builds a bureaucracy because they want to, they just build one because they don't have the trust that things will go the right way otherwise. And yeah. so other ways of doing this, generating the same trust is just to uh, at the boundaries within which people can operate just like you did, like, you know, let the, Purchases under a thousand dollar, they're really not worth your time. Let people make their own decisions, or like many companies do, let an agent in a call center offer anything to the customer that can keep them, keep them happy up to a hundred dollars. You know, mm -hmm. it's uh, it's ultimately far more efficient to everyone than that that request has to go up three layers uh, while the customer waits in frustration. Right, and you end up spending more than a hundred dollars doing that too. Oh, yeah, a lot more. And people are often not at all conscious of the time they spend on all that meta management, right? So um, when you just start calculating a little bit how much each min each meeting minute actually costs, that gives them far more of a feeling for, yeah, should we really spend our time on this? And as we mentioned before, uh, Henry, it's in those moments where you can say, is this really about success or is this about perfection that we're talking about this for mm -hmm. an hour, right? Yeah. Uh, the success is keep the customer happy, keep earning their dollars. Does it have to be perfect? No. Who's asking for perfection? So, Roland, would you please then you know, talk about how, what, you know, what happened to you over your life, the defining moment 
that inspired you to become an advocate for dealing with startups and scale things? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'd say looking back on my career, I've been extremely lucky to have been part of three scale up journeys each of which was going from about 10 to about a thousand employees in about three years time. So, you know, having had that experience, I saw some similar uh, levers being pulled that worked really well, but I also saw some errors and caveats that um, these founders would walk into. And so now I have this urge to tell people about the movie I've seen a few times already, tell them what's gonna happen if they don't watch out, right? Um, and so that helps me to, um, to, to let founders know how to prepare for the future. And this all started really when I was um, in uh, Belgium and I had been uh, a student at Brussels Free University studying media and technology. And this was just about the time that newfangled inter, um, you know, information uh, media came out, such as online databases. Um, and um, I was so lucky to be one of the first to be actually teaching this newfangled thing called the internet mm. to students at a university. And I could see the potential right away. At that time, it was still very awkward. You had to log into some kind of a mainframe computer and use awkward commands like escape um, colon W Q exclamation mark to just finish an email. You had to remember all of that, you know, so the world has definitely moved on a little bit since then. Uh, but yeah, it gave me an early view into the potential of interactive media for the future. And from then on, I, I was involved in starting the very first web company in Belgium back in 1994. In 96, we started building the very first broadband internet offering for consumers in the whole of Europe. And so very, very early uh, experiences. And I'd say what inspired me then to start mo focusing more about the management side of things was just that growth journey in that company where we launched Broadband Internet. It was called Telenet. And in those three years, as I mentioned, we grew from like eight to, I believe, 1,300 employees in those days. Mm. Um, and so you can imagine how much of a fast forward experience that is in terms of strategy, management, leadership principles. We had... I believe seven different strategies in those three years. We had five CEOs. Um, so basically all the things that normally take about 25 years to pass now happen in three years. You could see the effects of how people were operating as leaders or not operating as leaders very well. And that gave me a passion for seeing the drive and seeing the effect of how much good leadership can make a difference. And uh, I've ever, ever since then, I've kept focusing on that and kept coaching CEOs about it. Even when I was still working in these companies, I would always find out to somehow a sold out person the CEO would come to for advice. And uh, I've always tried to uh, find the balance between, yes, how can we make this company more robust and more predictive while at the same time keeping that startup zeal alive because that's why we all joined that company in the first place right yeah okay so from a slightly different perspective mm -hmm. please share an experience you had early on that still influences how you approach business today um yeah i say um early on in telenet uh this was still pretty much organized like early startups used to be there was a business side and there was a technology side and these people hardly spoke to each other but before, because we were launching this new product, broadband internet that nobody had heard about, uh, there were a lot of technical aspects that we needed to understand better. And um, we quickly went to, uh, to a situation where I just uh, started be really becoming friends with the head of the technology department. We were uh, basically uh, inseparable. We were making all the decisions together. I told him about business. He told me about technology. And it became um, almost a situation where even if he would say, no, that's impossible, you cannot do that. And then I would say, well, but what if you change this config setting? And then he would say, oh, that's completely against the book. And I'm like, yeah, but would it work? You know? <laughs> and so then he was, would be intrigued, like, actually, why don't we try it? And that would allow us to move forward much faster than the competition. And at the same time, he challenged me on the business side as well what if we launched it more like a, uh, a traditional consumer product rather than um, a product that was only meant for the techies and that 
still today has led to this company being the market leader uh, about 25 years after we launched everything. Mm -hmm. Very good. So what does success look like for Roland Siebeler? <laughs> well, I'd say success, uh, first of all, um, really means having a positive impact on the companies I work with. Um, I, I, you know, in America, especially people often measure success in monetary terms. And of course, I'm not blind to that either. But I would say uh, more than just how much can you earn, it's much more important. Can you actually help people move forward to a better place in the world, a better place in life, a better way of managing their business? So um, that's why I'm happy when a company such as Inrule reaches this point of being acquired, um, you know, getting all the funds they need to grow further, even if it means I may not be working with them anymore in the future. It feels like a graduation, like a leaving the house kind of situation like the parents would see. Um, but that creates more room for for new people and second I would say it's not just about the companies I work with but then also on the personal impact like are there certain areas where I can pinpoint you know this CEO this CTO has really um, you know benefited from this coaching because they've learned something they've discovered something in themselves uh, that will make them a more effective person in life and maybe also a a happier person in life over time, right? So uh, those areas I really associate with success for me. Um, next to that, of course, it's nice to, uh, you know, be comfortable and to uh, be able to, uh, to, to visit nice places and to get your customers invited to nice places as well. All of these are, of course, trappings we like and to take good care of your family is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'd say ultimately, I've always lived by the, by the motto, like if you do good things in the world, the rest will follow. Okay. So from, from a consulting company perspective, what are mm -hmm. your top three business challenges or concerns? Top three business challenges from a consulting company. So you would say in terms of the business model of a consulting company? Yeah, from, from your perspective, from your yeah. consulting practice, what are your top three challenges or, or concerns? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I would say um, from a consulting and coaching perspective, striking the right balance between having customers find out the answers in their own time versus you telling them what to do. Mm -hmm. Very often we feel we have the solution right at hand and yet we know it's not effective to tell people, why don't you just do this? And sometimes I even have customers asking me, stop the Socratic questions already. Tell me what you think I should do. And then when I do, they will say, well, no, I'm not going to do that because I don't like being told what to do. So you know, finding that balance is, I think, a challenge for every coach or consultant or facilitator, however you define the role, uh, to, um, to keep the customer in a confident situation where they can feel they are making the decisions and it's not you making the decisions. Sure. I also kind of relate that to, I call it the Zen of business improvement because the journey is much more important than the end state. Absolutely. And isn't it the same for relations, the same for travel, the same for, um, you know, your financial journey, uh, the same for life in general. In the end, it's what you look back on is the journey, not the end points, right? Right. So when customers, when, when they start look, thinking they need, need help, what's yeah. the most important question they should be asking when they consider using you for um, your coaching or mentoring? Yeah, I'd say the most important question is, what do you think you could do with a coach, with a consultant, with a facilitator that you don't think you can do yourselves as a team? Mm -hmm. And that can be as a matter of degree, so it could be that they can just move faster or grow faster or have more impact, or it could just be that there are things they really do not know how to do in any way without a coach or a consultant or a facilitator being involved. For example, um, if there are certain investors around the table they'd rather not have around anymore, <laughs> they may really not have the knowledge on how to deal with that and the same for certain thorny HR issues um, 
sometimes it's a blind spot. Like I was talking to one prospective customer who said, you know, my sales aren't growing as I, as I would have expected. And um, we had talked about his team. He had about 30 people out of which there was one sales and marketing person. And I said, so what does um, your sales and marketing person do then? And he's like, well, they write content. So I'm like, okay, so they're more of a marketing person than a salesperson, really. And he's like, I don't really know the difference between sales and marketing. So then you sometimes get to these points of, oh, you really have a blind spot there that you just need to fill with some new knowledge. Um, and how do I bring that across in a gentle way, of course? Yeah. Okay, so thinking about your consulting practice now, if you had to start all over again from scratch today, what behaviors would you keep and what would you do differently? Um, I'd say um, probably most more experienced consultants and coaches will tell you this. In the beginning, you're trying to reach out aggressively to potential customers and you're trying to really sell your value. And I think in this business, that simply doesn't work very well. It's much better to um, start with um, offering advice where you can in public fora, in public speaking, in a podcast interview such as this, where it can be of help to people. And those that really need your help then will reach out to you. I, I truly believe that this is more of a pull business than it is a push business. And I would rather, um, if I started out again, I would just completely focus everything on that. Okay. All right, so well, we could keep talking on and on, and we're running out of time here, and I want to honor your commitments because I know you said you had a hard stop. So, mm -hmm. um, how can people learn more from you? What, how can they contact you? Well, um, the easiest is um, if they go to the website for uh, where is also my book. Uh, it's called Scaling Silicon Valley Style. So, a little bit of a long URL, but it does work www.scalingsiliconvalleystyle.com. And uh, the reason why I have that is because people have trouble writing out a Dutch name. So, you know, <laughs> prefer working with, uh, with that American uh, uh, URL. So scalingsiliconvalleystyle.com. Uh, as I mentioned, that's also my uh, book title. And so there's three chapters available there and forms and uh, ways of contacting me. Um, we always publish a lot of new content, but a lot of it goes through our mailing list. So uh, when people sign up for those, they get the earliest access to new content, such as a new Series A playbook that we're working on at this stage. Wonderful. So I've really enjoyed talking with you today. Roland, this was great. I'd like your um, focus on you know, success, not perfection. I mean, that, that is a really important concept. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that our viewers will find your story and you're going to be just as fascinating as I did. So thank you so much for your time today, Roland. I really enjoyed it. I really appreciate it, Henry. Thank you for the invitation once again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of the Business Performance Podcast. For more episodes and strategies, visit welcome.ppqc.net backslash blog. That's www.welcome.ppqc.net backslash blog. And remember... If you don't know where you're going, any road will do.